What is up, you guys? Welcome to another edition of the Fundamental Health Podcast. One of the things that really gets me excited is humans living well and living fully and being fully alive and fully fertile and being very vital humans. And so when I see reviews like this one, it makes me just really want to cry. It just makes me very uh, taken aback. It pauses me in my tracks and it makes me very proud of what we are doing at Hardened Soil. So this is a review from Allie B who took our beef organs product. She says, my husband and I recently started taking hardened soil supplements a month ago. He's taking the whole package, which is our supplement with testicle in it, the most testicle of any desiccated organ supplement on the market, I may add, while uh, I'm taking the prenatal stack. Yes, 18 capsules a day. Our prenatal stack consists of beef organs, bone marrow and liver, and our lifeblood supplement. Um, Allie goes on to say, that my whole life, I struggled with terrible PMS and painful menstrual cycles. I've never known that time of the month to be easy, but in my first cycle, taking these supplements from Hardened Soil, it was so much easier. It was life-changing. No cramps, no pain, and such light flow, which I've never experienced before. My second cycle taking them, I finally just found out I'm pregnant. Can't wait to continue taking these and so thankful for this company. This is amazing, you guys. This is why we do what we do. I firmly, solidly, deeply believe in the power of organs, especially grass-fed, grass-finished, regeneratively raised organs like we make it hard in soil. And for so many of you, these are hard to get in your diet. Our ancestors have always eaten these. They've always been tri prized the most treasured foods. And so I'm very proud to have built a company that makes these highest quality organs on the planet available to all of you guys easily. So you can check us out at heartandsoil.co and the products in this review were whole package beef organs, bone marrow and liver and lifeblood. And our mission is to help you all reclaim your birthright to radical health. My guest on this week's podcast is Patrick Moore. He is a former president of Greenpeace and he wrote the book, Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom. It's quite a title. And we talked about a lot of very controversial things in this podcast. This podcast is exciting for me because it begins a series of three podcasts this week with Patrick Moore, next week with Alex Epstein. And then after that, hopefully with Saifedean Amos uh, about Bitcoin, in which we really start to fall down the rabbit hole of climate change and then cryptocurrencies. This is a little bit outside of the realm of what I usually talk about on this podcast, but I think it's very relevant to the world that we live in today. So many of the things we care about, I believe, will be threatened under the guise of climate science and climate change. And I wanted to go down this rabbit hole myself and see if there's good science to corroborate an anthropogenic climate change narrative, or if this is yet another thing that we're being fed that isn't really based on sound scientific evidence or is based on poorly orchestrated models. So I'll let all of you make the decision with your own research but it was very, very fascinating learning about Patrick's work, learning about the research we talked about in this podcast, and learning about Alex Epstein's work next week. So enjoy this podcast with Patrick Moore, and check out his book if you're interested. It was a very worthwhile read, super fascinating. If you like this podcast, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you prefer to listen. This helps us spread this message to more people, which is ultimately what it's all about. Just like the review you heard in the intro, uh, a woman who conceived with hardened soil supplements, I want the message of animal-based diets and living in an ancestrally, evolutionarily consistent manner as humans to spread to as many people as possible because people feel better when they do this. So as a thank you to everyone who leaves a review on Apple Podcasts, I'm going to be giving away a signed copy of my book every month to one person who leaves a review there. So thank you. Also, if you like this information and you want more of it, please check us out at hardensoil.co and subscribe to my censorship-free newsletter. It's a very important thing. As many of you know, I was deleted from Instagram recently. I'm back as CarnivoreMD 2.0. And I was deleted for saying things that I believe are very true and are now proven by science. And so where is Instagram? Well, they're on the woke side of media, unfortunately, and they don't seem to be planning to reinstate my account anytime soon. So if you want to hear more from me about COVID or anything in general, please subscribe to the censorship-free newsletter. 
The link is in my bio at Instagram or it's, there's a pop-up at the hardensoil.co page. Let me know what you guys think of this content because like I said, I'm really stepping out of the box here, but I think it's very, very important. Love you all. Stay radical. All right, Patrick Moore, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Paul. It's, uh, it's like we're it's both in our summer here. places. I know we are. We're both in our we're both in our getaways. It's great to have you here. I think this will be a really interesting conversation. As my audience knows, I've begun to go down the rabbit hole of many things, but one of these is climate, climate change, um, and this is an important conversation for me because so many of the things that I care about uh, often produce CO2, whether that's by proxy because it's cows that are, that are burping a little bit of methane that becomes carbon dioxide, or it's because you know, we're mining cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and that creates carbon dioxide. And so many of these things that I care about, I think have potential to affect millions, if not billions of lives positively proper human nutrition, well-raised meat, cryptocurrencies that are decentralized and free us from the tyranny of central banks and inflation uh, are, I believe, going to be threatened in the future under the guise of climate change and carbon dioxide uh, fear uh, framing. And so I thought that with your history, and I really enjoyed your book, uh, Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom, but I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about all of this and dig into how much veracity, how much truth there is to some of these arguments. So I thought maybe you could start us off. Why don't we start with polar bears? Because I thought there's a, there's a great chapter in your book about polar bears, and it kind of ties into a lot of other things, like the Pleistocene Ice Age and all of these things. So do you want to tell us the story of polar bears and whether they're really going extinct and, and how that ties us into like larger perspectives on temperatures and carbon dioxide levels on this planet? What an interesting subject polar bears are, Paul. The, the irony of the whole situation, and it makes me smile, is that if it wasn't for climate change, there would be no polar bears, period. Because there weren't any polar bears until this Pleistocene Ice Age came on, only two and a half million years ago, which is a blink of an eye in geological time. There had never been any polar bears for the previous three and a half billion years because for some reason there weren't any mammals until a hundred million years or so ago and there just wasn't anything that could turn into a polar bear until now. And by now I mean in this present Pleistocene Ice Age which started two and a half million years ago during that time there have been 40 or up maybe as many as 45 major glacial periods, advances of the glaciers covering the whole of Canada and half of Russia and much of Antarctic. Uh, we are now in an interglacial period, thankfully. Humans managed to survive through the last major glaciation, uh, but it wasn't a very pretty time. And now we're in a time where at least many species of life can live where there is no ice, and some can even live where there is ice. But there wasn't any ice until this Pleistocene Ice Age came on in the Northern Hemisphere began to freeze up at the North Pole on a regular basis about two and a half, three, three million years ago. And it's been there ever since. The polar ice cap has never gone away completely during these 40 to 45 glacial advances. So, but by this time, there had evolved the Eurasian brown bear, which in North America we call grizzly bear, but it's the same species. The, North, the, 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 the grizzly bear came to North America over the land bridge at the same time humans, reindeer, which we call caribou, timber wolves, which we call timber wolves, uh, and uh, brown bears, they came across. But before that, during this ice age, probably about 600,000 years ago, there was enough ice on the northern polar ice cap so that you could walk around on it over thousands of square miles. And that's where the seals, the ring seal primarily, was breeding under the ice and therefore had to create breeding holes through the ice, come up and give, give birth to its young and then take it back down again eventually. Uh, some brown bears decided to go north and 
Over many, many thousands of years, they became polar bears, turning white for camouflage against the ice, and their dietary uh, situation was so totally carnivorous that their whole digestive system had to adjust. Genetically, this occurred over thousands of years, and suddenly there was a thing called the polar bear. Now, the interesting thing is that it is such a recent evolutionary development, the polar bear, only because there's an ice age, and there hadn't been one for 250 million years until this one came on. The one previous was called the Karoo, K-A-R-O-O. -O. Look it up. It's on the internet. Anybody who wants to know about when the ice ages were can find out, and, and also find out that we're in one now, because the way people talk, you'd think we were in, in Hell's Kitchen or something, you know, instead of actually being in one of the coldest periods in the history of the Earth, which we are. Uh, and that's why the polar bear evolved, because it was possible to make a home on the ice in the winter and, and feed yourself, plump yourself up with seals with all the fat they have and survive through the summer when there wasn't as much ice and where seals weren't really available and had to forage on the land for very little, which grows there. Uh, you, you were right. It takes a while to tell these tales. Uh, so suddenly you have a polar bear and a Eurasian brown bear and they're separated from each other because one's on the ice and one's back on the land in northern Russia. And if they meet, though, which happens re not, not regularly but seldom, they can breed together. They're still so close genetically that they can breed and produce viable offspring, which is actually the definition of a species. So in some sense, by the, by the scientific definition of a species, they aren't separate species. They are varieties of the same species, which is the Eurasian brown bear. But they're so different uh, that we've called them a whole species. Maritimus is its uh, species name. So what about the recent history when people say that because of us, the ice is melting and the bears are going to disappear because they're polar bears, that is, will disappear because there's not enough ice for them to hunt. Well, first, look in my book at the aerial photographs from satellites of the snow cover and the ice cover in the winter, just 2019, for example. It's completely covered over the Arctic Sea. There's none of the Arctic Sea that isn't covered in ice in the winter. It goes beyond that into the Bering Sea and into the down near Norway, near Salzburg. And so there's lots of ice up there still every winter. In the summer, it does retreat some because the sun is, that's when the sun comes up. There's six months of sunshine and six months of darkness north of the Arctic Circle. And during that darkness, it freezes solid up there. During the summer, there's a retreat of the ice, which is good for polar bears. This is, that people think that if the, if the total Arctic was covered in ice all year, that that would be good for polar bears. It would not because the only way that those seals are produced is by plankton in the Arctic Ocean. And if the sun can't hit the sea, the sea exactly without there being three feet of ice in the way, then the plankton won't grow or will, very few of them will grow with what light does get through. So if the Arctic is half free of ice in the summer, a large part of the ocean becomes productive with plankton and that feeds the shrimp and that feeds the fish and that feeds the seals and the seals feed the bears. So the present state is actually possibly optimum for polar bears. So let's look at the population to see how that jives with that idea. And the fact is, for some reason, politicians and the media almost seem desperate not to tell the general public about the treaty that was signed in 1973, ending the unrestricted hunting of polar bears. Around that time, it had become really easy for wealthy people to get on a plane, charter a plane, go to the Arctic, hire an Inuit guide, and get a couple or more of polar bear rugs for their living room or wherever. And that had started to reduce the population of polar bears over hunting, not lack of ice. And so it is estimated that at that time, the polar bear population had been reduced to somewhere between six and 10,000. That treaty was signed by every polar nation. It virtually ended the hunting of polar bears, never mind the unrestricted hunting, which was going on before, where there were no rules. Now, some countries have banned 
killing polar bears by anybody altogether, anytime. Other countries like Canada allow a 2% harvest of polar bears, equal male and female, and you have to hire an Inuit guide to give the economy in the Arctic a little boost if you want to do that. And so it's very limited and it's way below the population growth rate of the species. And the way we know that is that today there are somewhere between 30 and 50,000 polar bears. Even the polar bear alarmists are not arguing with this because it's basically been shown by surveys that that's how many there are. And so now they're just talking about how in the future, by 2100, they'll all be extinct because the ice will continue to irre irreversibly continue to melt forever, etc., etc. when there's no actual way of knowing that. And so they're just scaremongering with uh, future predictions. And as everybody knows, the future is difficult to predict. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, hardly anybody ever does it correctly which is why I don't do that. I don't play that game of predicting what's going to happen with the solar maximum, minimum, CO2, whatever. We don't know how to predict what the future of the climate on the Earth is in 2100. Just don't, we cannot do that. That's my position. People who say we can are pretending they have a crystal ball, which is a mythical object. It doesn't exist. There is no fortune teller that can tell you what 2100 is going to look like and a computer model is not any better at 2100. It's good at taking assumptions and running them quickly so that you don't have to spend five years doing the calculation. But what comes out the other end is entirely based on the assumptions that you put in. All these people are assuming that increased CO2 is going to cause a certain amount of warming of the climate. And they don't know that because they don't even know that the amount of warming of the climate that has occurred so far is 100%, 50%, 10%, 1% attributable to carbon dioxide, because it is a greenhouse gas, but a very weak one compared, say, to water vapor. And they make all kinds of assumptions. And an interesting aside, they call us skeptics. Well, they call us deniers a lot of the time, too. But the nice word for us is skeptics. And the goofy thing about that is that the entire first principle of science is skepticism. That is, that is what you're supposed to be if you're a scientist, not a true believer. You're supposed to be skeptical of everybody's assertions and question them. So it's actually a great compliment to be called a skeptic uh, of people's predictions for 2100, because I am a hardened, died in the blood true one. I am a skeptic. So good, keep calling me that. Just don't call me a denier. Now I've been called a rejectionist, a climate science rejectionist. I think I'm the first person that's been called that. It's by Sean Holman, a Canadian academic who uh, panned my book in a left-wing rag in Canada called The Tai And it had absolutely no effect because he actually didn't find anything wrong with my book. He just said that other people said there was something wrong with my book and stuff like that, that I didn't interpret their studies correctly things like that, without really getting into uh, what I did wrong. And the fact is, I stand by everything in the book, and it's all well referenced to boot. Uh, so I'm a rejectionist now, and I, I don't know exactly what they say I'm rejecting. I think it's their opinions that I am rejecting. So well done for doing so. Uh, a skeptic is someone who disagrees with your conclusions. Right. If you say, I say the climate will change by five degrees by 2100, that's their conclusion. But a heretic, on the other hand, is someone who disagrees with your assumptions. And that's what's going into the computer model, not what's coming out of it. And that's where we have to focus is on the assumptions they are making when they do these computer models, because that's where the critique should apply. What comes out the other end is determined by what goes in the front end of a computer model. You can run them a million times and the same thing will come out if you put the same thing in. It's not as if they have a brain that can say, oh, I forgot to think about this. They don't do that. And polar bears, today there are 30 to 50,000 of them. They are really healthy. They are fat and happy. You take a picture of practically any one of them these days, except for National Geographic's photographer, 
managed to find a really old polar bear that was dying of starvation because it probably didn't have any teeth left. That's what happens. There's no nursing homes for old polar bears. They just die of starvation because they don't have any predators to eat them when they're weak. They can still put up a pretty good fight with the front end of them if anything tries to come at them, even when they're dying. There's a thing called dying, you know, last gasp. And that's what they would be capable of if some lesser animal tried to eat them while they were still dying. Wait till they're dead. It would be a good idea. And that's probably what happens with most of them. And so, and underneath, of course, on National Geographic, it said, this is what climate change looks like. A dying old polar bear. And it took them nine months to retract that, that they'd only seen one bear like that out of 30 to 50,000. But they did then emphasize that many, many polar bears are dying of starvation. And as if that was unusual. Well, how else would they die? Uh, maybe, maybe there's a disease that can kill them. I don't know. But basically, they die because they're too old to hunt anymore. And they go and lay themselves down and say goodbye. So that's the story of the polar bear. Yet we still have people saying there's no, that they're, they're going extinct. Uh, it's quieted down quite a bit, though, you know, since uh, Susan Crockford, who was an adjunct professor at the University of Victoria uh, and had a speaking engagement with them for many years. They fired her, they canceled her because she came out and challenged the people who were saying the polar bears are going extinct. Uh, her and I have been very active on this file. She's definitely the leader in the research on it. Uh, I've had a fair amount of success telling this story uh, that the polar bears are not going extinct. And one of the na nastiest parts of this story is the Inuit people themselves who actually live in the Arctic where there are no trees and lots of polar bears and ice. They passed a polar bear management plan in their parliament in Iqaluit, which is the capital of Nunavut, which is the treeless part of northeastern Canada. It's a huge area. Uh, Baffin Island is is the sort of center of it, and Iqaluit is on the southern tip of Baffin Island. And they passed this management plan because there are too many bears in their estimation today, that they are coming into their villages, they're even killing some people, and they passed this management plan which now allows them to defend themselves and their family from polar bears. Prior to that, polar bears were, were such a sacred cow, or bear, I guess, uh, such a sacred bear that it was pretty much illegal to kill one no matter what it was doing. And so this news, this was a big deal for the Inuit passing in their own parliament, a polar bear management plan that had stipulations in it. It was not reported in any newspaper or media outlet in Canada or the United States where all this fuss has been about there not being enough polar bears. They just don't want to hear, I suppose, that there's some people who actually live there year-round who think there's too many now. And that's the, a low level to stoop to, to reject that fact that is from the people who live there. They're nice people. They're good people. It's, hard, it's a hard life up there, even with the modern conveniences that they have now compared to what it was like and all they had was sled dogs and... Uh, and sleds and igloos. I mean, it was a pretty simple life. And they managed to survive. They, they've been there for two, three thousand years, coming from, of course, northern, the northern old world in the first place, and then gradually migrating around the polar, polar circle uh, and surviving there. And because of the dogs, they could fend off polar bears. Uh, Many of them still have dogs and still have sleds. I mean, they, st they still use these traditional ways. But uh, snowmobiles are pretty popular, too. So it's, it's a very interesting story that you tell in the book. And I, I love reading about it. I thought it was so fascinating. I want to show a couple of graphics from the book so people who are watching on video can see these. I showed the articles. Was this the one you were referring to earlier, the picture of the ice cap uh, when it's large yes. in the winter? 
It's like so, that for six months. Right. Practically. I mean, in the exactly. Scenario. And the point you're making and in then, the book is that then it, there's it all... expands. Yeah. Do you have the picture of the summer one I have in the book? I do. I can pull that one up as well. Um, and it's, uh, let me find that not one. any small amount of ice. I think it's probably the next one. Perhaps there's something in between, though. This is it, right? Let's see. It's the only other one that shows a polar image. This one, right? Yes. You can see that in the summer it shrinks, but it's still bigger than Greenland, which, if anybody knows, is you know the world's largest island, I believe, unless you count Australia, which is bigger. But... It's massive. There's lots of ice there, but there's also lots of open ocean in the Arctic where the plankton and the fish can grow to feed the seals, which the bears want in the winter. And they only go out on the ice in the winter anyways. In the summer, they come ashore onto the Canadian islands and other places. Uh, I don't know uh, the annual ecology of the polar bear as well as I might, but I do know that. They, they basically... The females come on land to give birth if they're pregnant, and they hibernate all summer in dens. It's interesting. It's the opposite of bears in the southern areas where they den in the winter and give birth. In the Arctic, they den in the summer and give birth, because you're not going to do that out on the snow. It's pretty hard to find a den on the ice, but they can find places to den uh, on the land, and the males uh, just scavenge for food. The, the female doesn't need to worry too much about food because they're in their den and give birth uh, and they're fat from the previous summer so they just use that fat over the summer from the previous winter they have to use that fat over the summer and the males have to scrounge and they eat they'll eat anything uh, they'll eat seaweed they'll they'll eat rabbits they'll eat whatever happens to be around berries there's not much growing on the land so they will actually go into the low tide and eat the kelp which has has nutrition, uh, so they're 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 an omnivore in that sense, like all bears are, uh, like we are. We have similar dentition, uh, and uh, it's just so sad that the good story of polar bears that that because of that treaty they have recovered so much, and because the conditions in the Arctic appear to be quite conducive to their continued flourishing one would think we should celebrate the polar bears rather than going around with signs saying that the world is coming to an end. And, you know, with regarding the world coming to an end, people have been predicting that for a long time. There's the guy on the corner with a sign saying the end is near. They used to say the end is nigh, but I don't think anybody knows what nigh means anymore. So the end is near is what it means. And the end has never come, despite these people's predictions. So the, 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 the doomsday crowd is batting absolute zero. They don't even have one doomsday to report. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Like, if, if it was one out of 25,000 doomsday predictions, okay, somebody was actually right for a change. The other 24,999 were dead wrong. But at least then you could say that it's possible because of a historical precedent that there would be a doomsday. But we don't have one yet. So apparently this situation we're in today is so incredibly unique and horrible that there's going to be a doomsday as a result. And that's a lot of hooey, in my estimation. I wouldn't bet on it for a minute. It's just that you'd think that people would notice that no doomsday prediction has ever come true. Otherwise... It, the doomsday would be over, and we would be have been not only doomed, but been doomed, like for good. So, it, I mean, I don't even know what this thing looks like, the end of the earth. I mean, they say, some people say the earth is coming to an end. And does it blow up, implode, catch on fire, and turn to a crisp? I'm not sure what exactly they mean by come to an end. So, uh, you know what I think? I think that people who are afraid of the end of the earth coming 
are actually projecting their own fear of their personal death. I think a lot of people are afraid of dying, and maybe that's one of the reasons religions exist, uh, is so that you can believe in something after you die is going to happen to you, uh, gives you a, a com comfort to think that you're going to be in heaven or whatever. Um, but I'm not afraid of death, and therefore I don't think the world is coming to an end because my death will not be the end of the world. It will only be the end of the world for me, but I'm just one of quite a small number of people, never mind life forms on this planet. In, think, imagine how many worms there are, how many termites there are, and how many ants there are, and how many bees there are. The insects actually are not only pretty close to half the known species on Earth, like 50% of the 1.7 million species are insects, and half of those are beetles. So beetles are 25% of all the species on Earth, and probably many, many of those populations outnumber humans by a lot, So in terms of individuals. So if, you know, if you think that uh, everything has a soul, there are quite a few souls about, and... I do not believe that they're all going to be lost in, in, into eternity by some apocalypse. The apocalypse is a figment of our mind, and I do believe that it is a figment of the minds of people who are afraid to die, that, that are clinging to some idea that they may be able to still be alive after they're dead or something. But... It's not true in my estimation. I think we pass on as atoms and molecules and chemicals. Uh, you can't take that away. Uh, but we do decompose, uh, which is not a very nice word, but um, it happens to the best of us. What have you got coming So I've placed on the screen... Yeah, I placed on the screen a picture from your book, which I think you use in the discussion of polar bears. And I think this will be a good jumping off point, a good segue to conversations about climate change uh, to give people a little more perspective. And this is, maybe you can walk us through this, but this is a graphic for people that are just listening that goes back 65 million years. And on the y-axis is global surface, surface temperature anomaly from the present, and, um, and then zero is all the way at the right end. And you can see in this graphic that uh, 65 million years ago, um, there was a long period between 65 and 45 million years ago, there was a long period where the global surface temperature anomaly on the Earth was 10 to 16 degrees above what it is now. And you have noted on this figure that the Earth is ice-free for those really 30-plus million years and the Antarctic glaciation only began 33 million years ago. Do you want to walk us through this graphic a little bit? I think it helps give us some perspective. Sure. Now, I know a lot of people think that 65 million years is a long time, but that's only since the last major extinction occurred of the dinosaurs. And so it marks an important point in the history of life, but it, this is the very recent period of life on Earth. Be, you know, you, if you think that life has been here for at least three and perhaps three and a half billion years, this is just a tiny fraction of that. But it is the most recent tiny fraction, which shows the temperature curve. Now, the, tr the truth is, before this graph begins, in other words, before 65 million years ago, there was another nearly 200 million years when there was no ice on the poles after the Karoo Ice Age ended. So what you see here is at the arbitrarily beginning about when the, the, the dinosaurs went extinct, uh, almost certainly due to the asteroid impact near Yucatan, south of Florida, which sent billions of tons of debris. It penetrated the Earth's surface, the, 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 the skin of the Earth, the outer crust, and sent billions of tons of debris into the stratosphere where it remained for long enough to block out the sun sufficiently to basically end photosynthesis, which meant the whole food chain of, of life. And that's why so many species went extinct then, and possibly during the previous four 
extinctions, which we know going back a couple of hundred million years, uh, where, where similar things probably caused it, whether it was massive volcanic action in the earlier years or asteroid strike, almost certainly the major extinctions were caused by a wiping out of the food chain which begins with plants and photosynthesis. So then you see the temperature after the uh, major extinction in 65 million years ago, the temperature rose up to what we call the Eocene thermal maximum the Eocene just being the name of that age. And that is the warmest it's been in recent history on the Earth. There were a couple of warm periods prior to that, many, many more millions before, which were approximately that warm. When the Earth is that warm, there is simply no ice anywhere, neither on the poles nor on the tallest mountains. The, it, well, it could be on the very highest mountains there was some ice but not the kind of glacial situation we have to, today on high mountains, especially the Himalayas and uh, even in the Rocky Mountains and certainly in the very far north. Then, so what you can see here, if you start, that's 50 million years ago approximately when that peak of global temperature occurred. We don't know why that happened. There's so many more things we don't know why they happened. We just happen to be able to, 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 to to show through marine sediment cores and isotopes in those marine sediment cores from hundreds of millions of years past, we can interpret temperature, CO2, and a bunch of other factors from proxies, as they're called, indicators, which are in those sediments, and we can age them. So that's how we get this curve. So this was the warmest it's been for a long time. There was no ice anywhere, and no ice occurred until about 30 million years ago, ice began to form in the Antarctic. The climate in the Antarctic is completely different than the climate in the Arctic. It's colder. That's because it's almost all ocean surrounding a few big islands that are basically around the South Pole that today are in this, you know, you can't see them as separate islands because they're covered in a couple of miles of ice or more. And that glaciation began, and then it cooled, it warmed up again a bit, uh, and, and that, those Antarctic glaciers shrunk. But then about 15,000 years ago, yes, 15,000 years ago at the middle Miocene climatic optimum, we, dis we began the, the great descent into the Pleistocene Ice Age, which you can see the, the arrow there that is the last two and a half million years. It's arbitrary where you say these ages end and begin. You have to draw a line somewhere. And so it was already quite cold before the Pleistocene Ice Age. But when the Pleistocene set in, it set in motion a series of glacial advances, as I mentioned before, 40 to 45 of them, and then retractions. And the interesting thing is we think we do know what causes those cycles, which I, I have a graph of that in there too, of just the five million years previous, if you want to show it, and come forward to where we've been just in the last five million years, as it's very instructive. So here's the graphic of five million years of climate change. It blew up the last five million years from the last graphic. Why don't you walk us through this one? This is sort of the, quote, place to see an ice age which no one knows about. <laughs> right. Um, that's the funny thing, is that this is well known, very well known. And you can see from 2.6 million years ago where it begins with the 41,000 year cycle and then switches to the 10,000 year cycle for the last 1 million years. The 41,000 cycle is one of the Milankovitch cycles, and the 100,000-year cycle is another one of the Milankovitch cycles, and they are caused by Jupiter and to some extent Saturn by the gravitational effect, those cycles. So it looks as though the ups and downs, the glaciations are the peaks at the bottom, and the, the, war, the interglacial periods are the top of those cycles. There are 40 to 45 cycles there. It gets a little busy in the 41 year, 
kill it a thousand year cycles and it's harder to discern them going back but there appears to be as many as 45 of these cycles that sink in with the 41 and 1000 year Milankovitch cycles and as you can see as time has gone on over the last hundred thousand years it's become more up and down it's that that you're getting a little bit higher temperature in the interglacial periods but lower temperatures in the maximums which are at the bottom those are the glacial maximums and it may be that we are still just in the beginning of the Pleistocene Ice Age that it may get deeper than it is now we don't know the answer to that as I said nobody does but the, the climate over, of the earth over the last 6,000 years has definitely cooled, net cooling. We are now in a warming period, but the warming periods are not as big as the cooling periods, like the Little Ice Age, which was the most recent cool period in the Earth's climate during this interglacial period. The, the Little Ice Age was colder than it has been since the interglacial period began 10, 12,000 years ago. So it appears as though we may well be on already the 80 to 85,000 year descent into the next glacial maximum. And the next glacial maximum may be more severe than the last ones were if we're still in an entry into the glacial period, the Ice Age, sorry, called the Pleistocene. You have to remember the Karoo Ice Age, which is the previous one that started 350 million years ago and was a hundred million years before it ended in 250 million years ago. That was a 100 million year ice age. And here we are only 2.5 million years into the Pleistocene ice age and everybody's saying it's over. That it's that, that, that we come out of the ice age. We haven't come out of the ice age. We've just come out of a major glaciation. We're in an interglacial period and it's already going down on average, the temperature. Yeah, this is the 570 million year uh, graph that shows temperature in the blue and CO2 in the purple. And the summary of this is that there is no pattern to the temperature. It goes up, it goes down. It, that's what it does. And it goes up and down in between the up and downs. Whereas CO2 is definitely on a net decline. It has a trend that is a declining trend. And that little uptick at the end of the purple line is our contribution to atmospheric CO2. It's barely visible. It certainly isn't any higher than it has been any, you know, it's, it's not as high as even this part back in the Carboniferous it didn't go down that far. It's about where it was then. And who, we don't know why when the Carboniferous period occurred, which is when forests evolved, when trees evolved and global bio, biomass multiplied by at least an order or two of magnitude. Because if, if you think about it, the, the biomass of all the trees on all the mountains on Earth is way more than everything else put together, like way, way more than everything else put together. And so that's when that happened. We don't know exactly why my paper, uh, which is, is peer reviewed on this subject, uh, postulates that it had something to do with the fact that there was nothing that could digest lignin, which is why trees came into existence, was the evolution of lignin as sort of the concrete around the rebar of the cellulose in, in wood why they can be tall and strong like they are. Uh, and so we don't know. But we do know for sure that CO2 is at one of the lowest levels it's been in the history of the Earth, even today with our addition to it. And that temperature has just gone up and down in a completely unpredictable pattern. Sometimes there's hothouse ages, sometimes there are ice ages. And we're in an ice age, not a greenhouse age. And life has flourished through the greenhouse ages. People say things like, yes, but humans weren't here when it was that hot. No, but their ancestors were. 
The ancestors of humans obviously lived through those hot periods or we wouldn't be here. And something that people need to think about, which is kind of spiritual, actually, in its implications, is that every single individual of every human, every insect, every bird, every fish, every bacteria that exists today represents a continuous, successful reproduction since the beginning of life. The chain has never been broken. If it's broken, that's it. That genetic material doesn't move forward. We are the baddest ass bunch of species, not just us, but all the species that exist here today, have been through more than any of the species that went extinct before us. Now, it wasn't their fault that they went extinct in the case of an asteroid hitting the Earth, but our ancestors lived through that, or we wouldn't be here. It's sort of like the doomsday prediction. If there'd been a doomsday, we wouldn't be here either. But we, our, our genetic lineage, our genealogy, had no interruption. Mine didn't, yours didn't. My son, my two sons represent my contribution to that continuation. And my granddaughter represents a, a second generation of continuation of that beginning of life. It, 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 there's no other way to explain it than, than, than that. So think about yourself, whoever you are listening out there, as being somewhat of a secular miracle of incredible proportions that, you know, 99.9 plus percent of all the species that ever lived went extinct already. Whereas we, living people here today, and all the bugs and fish and everything else, all the birds, survived through all of that with continuous successful reproduction since the beginning of life. So make, that should make everybody who is alive and conscious very happy. Like right there, that one fact should just make you go, woo, woo, woo. I'm, I'm here because my ancestors lived through everything that the earth had to throw at them, everything the climate had to throw at them. We are still here because we are survivors of that entire three billion plus years of evolution. Yay. And if we, if we look at this graphic, I mean, this, this graphic, if people are not looking at this on YouTube, I encourage you guys to actually watch the video at this point to see this graphic. This graphic goes back 570 million years. And then we showed a graphic that was 65 million years, which is just this final portion. And then we showed a graphic which was 5 million years, which is this portion right here. Obviously, this x-axis is not entirely to scale. Um, but what you can see here is that there are periods in the past where the Earth's temperature has been significantly warmer than it is now. And there are periods with high levels of CO2 and low levels of CO2, and there's essentially no correlation here between carbon dioxide and parts per million. Now, another thing that I found striking as I've sort of begun to learn about this is that the, C the carbon dioxide in our environment, based on these ice cores and, and the way that we can go back 570 million years, which is really still a fraction of the amount of time the Earth has been in existence, has been as high as almost 6,000 parts per million. We're at 415 parts per million now. It's been as high as 6,000, and there's long periods where it's been 2,000, 2,500, when there have been large periods of biodiversity on the Earth. The Jurassic period, this is Jurassic Park, guys. This is the dinosaurs. There have been many forms of life on the planet when carbon dioxide has been 2,000 parts per million. 2,000 parts per million. And then as you point out in the book, since about 145 million years ago, there's been a steady decline in carbon dioxide, and no one really knows why carbon dioxide has been declining uh, since 145 million years ago, but it's gone from about 2,500 parts per million down to potentially a nadir of 180 parts per million. There's so many interesting points about this. You point out in the book that at 150 parts per million, really all plant life ceases, and then slowly over the last few probably thousand years or so, it's begun to recover and I say that potentially with a positive in implication, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has begun to recover a little bit from 150, well, 180 to 250, and then now 400. But if you look at this graph online, you can see that as carbon dioxide has been declining, the temperature went up. 
So less carbon dioxide, more temperature, and then, then the temperature was falling, and there's been all sorts of periods of discordance between carbon dioxide and temperature. And as you point out, if we look at this graphic, 1.64 million years ago, the, the Pliocene and the Pleistocene, our ancestors were around. This is there are hominids. Homo sapiens, Homo erectus were around when carbon dioxide was, I can't e extrapolate exactly on this graphic, Patrick, but I've got to imagine that, I mean, it looks like, you know, carbon dioxide might have been, uh, might have been as high as 500 or 600 or 800 or maybe even 1,000 parts per million when, when Homo species walked the earth. Would you agree with that or am I missing something here? I, well, there's a, there's a big debate about when all of that when when it went from monkeys to humans or apes to humans, uh, there were there were there were uh, apes that could stand on two feet long before they were called Homo. So uh, I've seen the writings about this. Some people claim that we didn't exist really until the Neanderthal, and but there's the Cro-Magnon, and then going back even further, there's. It was a gradual evolution. It wasn't as if all of a sudden it was one day a monkey and the next day a human. So uh, you, 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 all I can say is our ancestors gave birth to our, our progenitors. They, they gave birth and they gave birth and they gave birth through millions of years, and it ended up being a human. And... It, so it does, that doesn't really matter too much. That's why when someone says, well, humans weren't even here then. Uh, no, but whatever caused us to come into existence was here then, and they lived through it. And CO2, from a toxicity point of view, isn't even slightly an issue up until 50,000 parts per million. I mean, it isn't even, doesn't even matter. The, the Apollo 13 had between 20 and 30,000 parts per million before they solved the problem of scrubbing the CO2 out of the spaceship's atmosphere. Uh, uh, submarines go underwater for three months and have a high limit of 8,000 parts per million. And that's just completely conservative. They, it's not as if anything bad happens to you at 8,000. Well, they're not going to make a limit where something bad happens to you. They're going to make a limit where there's absolutely nothing bad happening to you. And above that, they just don't, they don't go there because they don't have to. They have the equipment to keep it below 8,000 ppm. But the people who work in greenhouses are working in 800 to 1,200 ppm CO2 perfectly well. It's not even slightly an issue. And so uh, I, I can't see any reason to think that saying, well, we weren't there then when CO2 was higher is even an argument because it, in, in our knowledge, to our knowledge, it was never higher than 10,000 during the period uh, from, from when modern life evolved, which is the Cambrian explosion of multicellular life. I mean, most people don't stop to think that for 3 billion years, all life was single-celled, i.e. microscopic, confined to the sea, right? And it wasn't a very interesting time from a life point of view. You couldn't even see the life. And it wasn't until multicellular life emerged in the Cambrian explosion of life 570 to 540 million years ago. And that all happened in the sea. It didn't happen on land. Life didn't come onto the land for another 100 million years after that. And it was probably the insects that came on first, the relatives of the shrimp and the crabs, uh, the crustaceans and the, anth the arthropods, they're probably what came onto the land first and then got wings and started flying around, probably way before the fish, the vertebrates, which are our ancestors, came onto the land. There were already insects uh, flying around all over the place. So it's a, it's a long history, and a lot of people can't get a million years in their head, never mind 500 million years or 3 billion years. But that's how old life is, just a fact. And I wanted to show, I thought we'd also show this graphic from your book, which is pretty cool. Uh, a lot of people don't understand how good carbon dioxide levels are in the atmosphere for plants. And they don't understand that as, even yeah. in the last 
few hundred years, as carbon dioxide levels have risen in the atmosphere, plant, the, the Earth has undergone massive greening. You want to walk us through this gentleman's experiment uh, that I'm showing here as he grew pine trees in different levels of CO2? Yes, this is uh, Craig Idso's dad back in the day. Um, they have a website called CO2 Science, which has all the peer-reviewed literature on CO2 and its effects on everything. It's a huge website and is the best in the world on this count. But there what you can see is at the time this photo was taken, CO2 was approximately 385. That's what AMB means ambient, which means what level it's at now. So it was 385 then, it's 415 now. But at 385, that tree, little pine tree, grew that big compared to when you add 150 more parts per million or add 300 more parts per million or add 450 more parts per million in the identical environment, oh, the only change was CO2. They all had all the water they needed. They all had the same amount of sunshine. They all had the same amount of nutrients. The only change was CO2. And this is why there is a greening of the earth occurring today because of our addition of about 40% more CO2 than was there 100 years ago. This is, this is documented very clearly by NASA. You go to NASA greening the earth, you'll see it by the, the, the Australian top research body, which is the Commonwealth Industry and Science Research Organization, CSIRO, uh, and, and others. And we have good maps for China and India and North America and Australia and the whole world showing that photosynthesis has increased by at least 30% in recent decades because of our addition of CO2 to the atmosphere. Now, a, kind of a funny story. I actually used to laugh at people who said that their plants, their house plants, did better when they talked to them. They, the house plants loved them and it made them feel good, and so they grew better because they were being talked to. And I'm going like, they don't have ears, you know. I mean, and they can't talk back. So aren't you just kind of making this up? Well, then I realized when you sit next to your plant, whether you're talking or singing or just breathing, you are breathing 40,000 parts per million carbon dioxide on your plant, which is like super saturated fertilizer to a plant. And so that's why they would... Uh, grow better if you sat for an hour a day and talked to them it would be a great boost to their nutrition as long as you watered them regularly so that, that that's the truth of the matter is that uh, co2 had sunk so low that it was the it was the limiting factor on the growth of plants in most parts of the world and our food crops and our forests that we use to make wood and so our addition of co2 to the global atmosphere has been worth trillions of dollars in benefit. Trillions in, in the fact that we get record food crops now. And a little bit more warmth, actually, for every one degree Celsius, 1.8 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature, Canada can grow food 200 kilometers further north, a mile and a half further north. That's a pretty big bunch of land when you think of how wide Canada is. And the same is true for Russia. So more CO2 and slightly more temperature will mean that people can live and grow food in larger area than they can today. And the other thing that people don't understand about the warming of the earth and the cooling of the earth is when it warms, it does so more towards the poles and hardly at all in the tropical regions. So as the earth warms and cools, the tropics remain approximately the same and it's the further north and south you go where the changes occur. So when the Earth's temperature increases by 10 degrees, it's not increasing by 10 degrees at the tropics, if any, but it might be increasing by 20 degrees at the poles and melt all the ice there and uh, allow something to grow. I mean, people talk about ice as if it's a living thing. The glaciers are dying. No, they're not. They're melting. That's not dying. When we die, we don't melt. And besides which... We do die. Glaciers don't die. They're not living in the first place, so they can't die. What are glaciers doing? 
they are preventing a forest from growing there where they are. If they weren't there and the rocks were exposed, soil would be developed by things growing there and trees would eventually come. It doesn't take long. If you, if you look at pictures in Alaska where the glaciers are retreating, those trees come marching right behind them. It does not take very long for bare rock to turn into a living ecosystem. And what would you rather have, a sheet of ice or a living ecosystem? That's the choice. I mean, we don't really have the choice because we don't control the climate. But that's the reality of when the Earth is in an ice age like it is now, vast areas are not forested or, or, or gra even with grasslands like the drier places are. The other thing about increased CO2, totally separate from being a fertilizer, is when CO2 increases in the atmosphere, it makes it easier for plants to get it because it's more concentrated. Therefore, they don't make as many holes under their leaves called stomata, which is where they suck in the CO2. And therefore, less water escapes through those holes. So plants become more efficient with water the more CO2 there is in the atmosphere. And that's why trees are marching out onto grasslands in the U.S. Southwest where it's arid. If you go to Arizona and Nevada, you will see on places that were former just pure grassland that trees are growing there now. And that's because there's more CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, some people say, well, we want the grassland. Well, then just cut the trees down and saw them up and make houses with them, whatever. But uh, don't worry about there being more CO2 because there was more CO2 in most of the Earth's past and it's a good thing, 100%. I'm, I'm a director of the CO2 Coalition. I was its chairman for a period of time. The CO2 Coalition is nearly 70 now top scientists and engineers and a couple of economists who know that CO2 isn't a problem and who believe that it is entirely beneficial and we have the facts to back it up. We have a, uh, a, C a CO2 Coalition website, co2coalition.org, with a huge amount of information on this subject. So please go to it and please read my book, Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom, because it actually g goes through 11 different situations where you are being scared with fake stories. And it's all about things that are either invisible, like CO2 and radiation, which nobody can see what it's doing, or so remote, like polar bears and coral reefs. Do you think maybe there's a reason why they picked polar bears and coral reefs, two of the most remote things in the world? Coral reefs are underwater in the tropics offshore. Polar bears are around the Arctic Circle. How many people can go and verify the count of polar bears? How many people can verify whether or not the Great Barrier Reef is dying or thriving. I can tell you it's thriving because I know the people who are telling the truth about it and who go there and study it. And it's only the people who are lying about it in order to get government grants to study it as if that's going to save it. This whole thing is a really super global scam. And it involves activists raising money, media getting advertising revenue for sensationalism, scientists getting money from government, because almost all this research is done with our money, and there's bureaucrats and politicians deciding which scientists will get this money for which research. And if you don't put climate change in your application for a grant, you're just not going to get the money. That's about what it, how it works. So it's not the scientists' fault. It's the politicians who are at the beginning of this process, deciding who is going to get paid to give up a scare story so they can go to the voters and say, I'll save your grandchildren if you vote for me. And then there's, of course, the crony capitalists who are taking advantage of the massive subsidies and tax breaks from wind and solar energy, which is completely ridiculous. It only works one third of the time. And the one third of the time when it doesn't work, you have to have something reliable that does work, which is probably going to be fossil fuels or nuclear or hydroelectric all of which these people oppose. And uh, it, it, it's just a, it is just a giant scam. It's a big money-making political power machine that has taken over the minds of men and women and children all over the Western Hemisphere 
Uh, not so much in China or India or Russia, but way much in the EU and North America and some of South America. It's just a shame. We're about to commit economic suicide if we go along with what they're telling us we should do. What we should be doing is continuing to replenish the CO2 in the atmosphere to levels that are most conducive to the growth of plants. We should learn to think like a plant because we depend on plants 100% for our existence. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for plants because they turn sunshine and CO2 and water into sugar and then turn it into themselves and then pass it on to us when we eat them or when we eat animals that eat them. It all goes back to plants and photosynthesis, every single bit of it. So if we think like a plant, we would say, wow, please give us a little more CO2 because we would like double or triple what we have now. That's the reason the greenhouse growers use double or triple than we have now in their greenhouses is because it increases the growth of their crops and plants and makes them more efficient. So let's make the earth more efficient at producing green things and don't worry about the polar bear so much because they're doing so well now. But remember that they are a very recent species and the only reason they exist is because the ice came in this Pleistocene Ice Age. Otherwise, they would not have evolved if there was no ice. So there's two sides to this coin. You say, oh, I love the polar bear. I want him to keep living. Well, if this Ice Age hadn't happened, there wouldn't be any polar bears to want to keep living, and there just would have been the brown bear. So it, it, it's not something that you should have like end-of-the-world opinions about. Because the world won't end if the Earth warms up, but some new species might evolve, and some might not be able to deal with the Earth warming up. But humans won't be one that can't deal with it, because we are a tropical species. Have you ever heard of the fact that humans came out of Africa, like from the equator? Everybody knows that, no? It was only a few hundred thousand years ago that anybody left the equator. We turned white because there wasn't too much sunshine here. And so we don't need the melanin to protect us from the ultraviolet rays, which are beneficial in that they help produce vitamin D, but they're also negative because they can give you skin cancer. So you look for a balance, and the balance is that white people just evolved because they came north from, they were, we were black when we came up here, our ancestors that is, it was quite a while ago, but just you know, really in, in geological time, it was just yesterday that people came out of Africa. That's because we are a tropical species, even today. We haven't lost our love for the tropics. You know, the only real climate refugees are the millions of people that get in a plane and go to a warmer place in the northern winter. And I'm one of them. I love the warmth. And, and so do most people. So to say that warmth is bad and cold is good doesn't really jibe with the human evolution. There are polar species, polar bears and penguins, but the only reason they've evolved is because the Earth got colder. And if the Earth gets warmer, it might be a little tough on them, but then other species will benefit from it even more. It, it's, it's not like as if we should hope the Earth never changes, because if change stops, time stops. Time and change are more or less interchangeable and dependent upon each other. So it's always going to change because time is always going to keep ticking on. And when time comes into contact with living things and moving things, it's going to keep changing. It's just natural. The Earth's crust is moving like slowly, but it is moving. That's what causes all the volcanoes and earthquakes. And uh, we just can't stop that. You can't stop time. You can't stop change. And so... And, and, and the idea that we are responsible, uh, here's a great graph. This shows the last four interglacial periods, which are the, the peaks there, and the last four glacial maximums, which are the bottom, where it peaks at the bottom. As you can see, they're following very similar patterns with the 100,000-year Milankovitch cycle of Jupiter's gravity changing the shape of the Earth's orbit around the Sun from more to less elliptical. But the key thing on this graph 
is that in each other interglacial period, the three previous, the Emian, the La Rouche, and the, sorry, Perfleet, in those three previous uh, interglacial periods, CO2 did not go up. In this one, look what CO2 has, has done. It's gone up to 415 ppm, while the temperature has not followed it. So it's broken from the temperature curve. And the truth of the matter is, in this whole graph, it's the temperature that is causing the carbon dioxide to go up and down, not the other way around. When the oceans warm, they give off CO2. When the oceans cool, they absorb CO2. And the oceans hold 50 times as much CO2 as the atmosphere does today. So there's a huge reservoir of CO2 in the oceans. So if the oceans lose 1% of their CO2, it causes close to a doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere because the oceans have so much more. So uh, the book has all this in it, explained for anybody to understand. Some of this stuff is pretty complicated to do on TV and video, but uh, the book is not so complicated. And can walk you through it in a logical way so you can understand what I'm talking about here. Yeah, the, um, the book is great, and, and it was really interesting to walk through all the different pieces there um, and see, see what it all was, uh, see how it all connected. But I thought that the, there are some key points there that I just want to highlight for people that, I, that I'm taking away from the study because I'm not a climate scientist. I, I'm a physician. And, but I'm interested in this because it connects to other things that I care about. And your point, the point that you made, and when I've, I've seen this graphic a few times, that if you look at these interglacial periods, this is the graphic that has been shared over and over by Al Gore and others saying, look, carbon dioxide levels and temperature are highly correlated over the last couple hundred thousand years. And the inference there is that, that carbon dioxide is rising and causing temperature to go up. And you make a really strong case, which I want to dig into in the podcast before we wrap up, about why that's probably false, about the, really the limited data on carbon dioxide as an actual strong greenhouse warming gas. Um, but if you look at those Vostok ice cores that you, that you show these graphics in the book, as you said, it's pretty darn clear that the temperature rises before the carbon dioxide rises. And just because two things are correlated doesn't necessarily mean that they are causal, or you don't know which direction the arrow of causality goes. And so there's been this assumption forever that everyone knows that when carbon dioxide goes up, temperature goes up. But these, because these two things are correlated, what if the arrow of causality goes in the other direction, as you're suggesting, that the Earth is warming potentially during these interglacial periods because of these Milankovitch cycles and other celestial phenomenon and this crazy, uh, you know, universe or this solar system that we live in, and that is causing carbon dioxide levels to rise from the ocean, which is a huge sink of carbon dioxide in general. And if you look at these graphics, as you said, the, the temperature rises first before the carbon dioxide rises. So I don't, it just feels like you said, we've all been hoodwinked. This is a, it, I just continue to fear, and I want to keep learning about this, that this is a big hoax. And as you suggested, I fear that it's for profit. So many of the things I see happening now are for profit. The, the demonization of meat is to promote the production and consumption of higher margin processed foods, many of which are plant-based. And I can only imagine at this point, the way that I make sense of it, is that all of these sort of climate arguments are are there because it somehow gives someone a profit, right? That there is, there's a profit uh, to be made here. And whether it's the solar manufacturer profits or it's, it's everyone gets online with these carbon credits, which are probably potentially meaningless, you know, like this mm -hmm. whole Tesla thing and all these industries that are built on carbon credits now. But there is a financial incentive for many people now to perpetuate this narrative of number one, anthropogenic climate change, and number two, carbon dioxide at the core of that. And so maybe let's move on to talk about the problems with the assertion, which we haven't really proven, as you say in the book, that carbon dioxide is a strong greenhouse gas, that, that, that 
it see, every, I think most people listening to this would say, wait a minute, I thought it was a proven fact that more carbon dioxide equals a higher temperature, but that doesn't sound like that's really the case, is it? No, it's not the case. And it is clear from detailed analysis of the interglacial periods, the last four in particular, which is a 400,000 year history from ice cores in Antarctic, that the temperature increase precedes the CO2 increase by an average of 800 years, which is an interesting number because that's about how long it takes the oceans to circulate completely. I mean, they, they, they're different everywhere. But 800 years is kind of a reasonable number for the, for the water which has contained CO2 to come back to the surface again after it has sunk because the oceans are all in circulation, and when water's at the surface and sinking, it takes CO2 down with it, absorbed from the atmosphere at the interface. And that CO2 stays in that water until it comes up again. Very often then it has become more saturated with CO2 from processes in the sea, decomposition of organic matter, for example. And when it comes up, it gives off CO2. And if when it comes up, it has been warmed during the period of years, it will give off more CO2 than if it was still at the same temperature it was when it sunk. So all of these factors put together indicate that temperature caused by variations in the Earth's orbital cycle and originally caused by very, the 41,000 year period caused by variations in the tilt of the Earth and therefore solar radiation moving further north or further south in the winter. Uh, uh, sorry, in the summer uh, in the northern hemisphere and then in the summer in the southern hemisphere, that that is what is driving the temperature changes. And the temperature changes are what are driving the CO2 emissions from the ocean and absorption into the ocean during cooling periods. It's interesting that the air holds more things when it's warm, like water, for example. The air can hold more water vapor as a gas so in other words, you can dissolve more water vapor into the atmosphere when it's warm than when it's cold, where it turns to liquid, turns to fog and clouds. But with liquids like the ocean, they hold less gas when they're warm and more gas when they're cold. It's the opposite of the atmosphere. And so the, the interface of the sea and the atmosphere, I'm looking at one right now out my window, I've got the tide going out here in Winter Harbor and the sun shining on the sea very beautifully, that interface where an invisible exchange is taking place with CO2 from the ocean and from the air. We don't know if we look out there whether the ocean is absorbing CO2 or whether it's giving off CO2, but it's one doing generally one or the other. In everywhere in the world where there's ocean, 75% of the earth has an interface with the atmosphere where this equilibrium is maintained between the concentration of CO2 in the water versus in the atmosphere. We, we have not been, we are not able to discern that because it's invisible and it's all over the whole world and it's happening everywhere differently all at once. Whereas with, from a satellite, we can see all the trees, right? And we can measure their biomass to a certain extent by the chlorophyll content, etc. So we've got a really pretty good idea of the relationship between the terrestrial environment and the atmosphere regarding CO2. But we do not have much of a clue about what the end result is between the ocean and the atmosphere, except with the theoretical fact that when oceans are warmer, they don't hold as much CO2 as when they're colder, and therefore would give it off if they warmed up and absorb it if they cooled down. And that is why most of us who studied this very carefully believe that CO2 is the result of warming, not the cause of it, in these many glacial and interglacial periods. It, th that is one, and you have noticed there possibly one of the top five salient facts that demonstrate that CO2 is not a major driver of warming of the Earth. It is a greenhouse gas, like so is a methane and, and, and a few others, but it's really water vapor that is driving that relationship between 
uh, how much heat is retained and how much is given off. We do not have any hard evidence that the carbon dioxide increase is the main cause of the slight warming that the Earth has experienced over the last 150 years. That's it, in a nutshell. And, and that is such a profound statement. I want that to sink in for people because that is certainly not the mainstream, that is not the mainstream perspective. And there are so many things now that are being done that are justified based on climate change. And as you were speaking earlier, I was thinking about this with increasing CO2 levels in the atmosphere. And this is closely connected with my appreciation for regenerative agriculture, which is raising cattle in a rotational system, grass feeding, grass finishing of cattle, really trying to mimic ecosystems of the Great Plains of the world where ruminant animals like bison or predecessors of cows, maybe were known as aurochs, grew. And what we find when we do that is that they burp out some methane, but then that methane becomes carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and then the carbon dioxide is fixed back into plants as plants inhale the carbon dioxide. And one of the major critiques of this type of agriculture is that it's not scalable, that we couldn't grow enough cattle to feed the people that would eat this way. And there are many problems with that statement and many reasons that I think it's a logical fallacy, but just one of them that I find interesting relevant to this conversation is that if the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere continues to increase, maybe to 500 or 600 or 800 parts per million, there's going to be more grass on the ground potentially. There's going to be more greenery for those cattle to eat. And when I visit, visited farms like White Oak Pastures in Georgia, that grass is green and it is lush and it is all over the place. And here in Costa Rica, where I spend a lot of time now, I'm in a tropical region because I'm a tropical human, like you talked about earlier. Uh, the, there are all of these hillocks, these hillsides with tons of green grass and the cows are eating it. And I'm thinking the greening of the earth <laughs> means that there's more land to graze cattle on, that there's more space for us to grow animals or plants. You know, and like you said, if, if there's more regions of the earth where plants are growing, we can feed more animals with those plants. And isn't it so ironic that we're being told that carbon dioxide is the enemy when it in many ways sounds like it's a friend to us within these, re within these reasonable levels of which it has historically always occurred on the face of the earth. And I, I want to highlight something you said earlier, which is that exhaled carbon dioxide, that our exhalation breath is 40,000 parts per million. Why do we think that carbon dioxide of 800 parts per million is going to be toxic to humans if exhalation and ex the exhaled breath of humans is 40,000 parts per million? And there's just all of these things that kind of tie together that I think are so fascinating. And one of the linchpins, one of the cruxes in, in my learning about this, and again, I'm still learning about it, has been like, wait a minute. Carbon dioxide isn't a strong greenhouse gas. There's a section in your book where you talk about the different layers of the atmosphere. And this was all new to me. The troposphere, then the tropopause, which is the intersection of the stratosphere, the stratopause, the mesosphere, the mes mesopause, and the thermosphere. And people may have heard these terms bandied about recently because there's all of these potentially self-absorbed billionaires launching themselves into the stratosphere. They're launching themselves, you know, 20 or 30 kilometers above the Earth, you know, not really in space, but they're out of the troposphere. And so you want to walk us through this a little bit, because in the book, what I was reading was that only certain gases can move out of the troposphere, which is the lowest level, into the stratosphere. And you make the point that it looks like carbon dioxide, in, in, in stark contradistinction to being a warming gas, might actually be one of the gases at the, at the intersection of those levels of the atmosphere that allows heat to move out of our atmosphere on the Earth. Yes, that's a really interesting point. Uh, first, uh, there are three ways for heat to move from one place to another. There's radiation, like when you're sitting in front of a fire and you feel the warmth even though the flame isn't touching you. There's conduction, which if you heat one end of a copper rod, pretty soon the other end will be hot because this heat has been conducted through the rod. And then there is convection, where if you heat a body of air, it rises and takes that heat up into the higher atmosphere. And that is the main way that heat moves up from the surface of the Earth 
to the troposphere tropopause, which is the end of the troposphere, where instead of continuing to cool, there's a break in the cooling and it starts getting warmer in the stratosphere. So the troposphere is actually a pretty complete barrier to convection. So that a lot of the heat that leaves the Earth goes up by convection to the tropopause and stops. From there, there is really only one way for all of the heat on the Earth to get off the Earth, and that is radiation. There's nothing to conduct it through into outer space. Convection cannot take heat into outer space because it ends at the tropopause and wouldn't work anyways because there, there is no convection in outer space. There is no conduction in outer space. There is only radiation. So in order to get the heat that is coming in from the sun and warming the Earth, to balance that with outgoing radiation, which would therefore keep the Earth at a constant temperature, much warmer than if it wasn't getting any sun radiation from the sun, it would practically be absolute zero because there wouldn't be any source of heat other than the radiation in the center of the Earth, which there is heat from it. That's why the Earth is hot in the middle, is because of the radiation, the heat of radiation decay. But the sun's energy is virtually all the energy that's coming into the Earth. And the only way it can get back into outer space is by radiation. And the main basis for that radiation is carbon dioxide in the stratosphere. Because water vapor is basically blocked at the tropopause. There's almost no water vapor in the stratosphere. There's no clouds in the stratosphere. The clouds stop at the top of the troposphere, which is just higher than Mount Everest by somewhere. So no land sticks into the stratosphere. It's all in the troposphere. And so the only way that radiation can get to outer space is by a greenhouse gas that is able to absorb and emit radiation Nitrogen can't do it, helium can't do it, hydrogen can't do it, but CO2 can do it. And H2O is the biggest one in the troposphere. That's where most of the action in greenhouse gas is taking place in radiation. But in the stratosphere, you've got CO2 doing the yeoman's job of getting rid of all the heat through radiation back to the space again with more of it coming in every day as the Earth rotates during the daylight times, radiation is always coming in from the sun, and therefore CO2 has to constantly re-emit that radiation to balance the energy of the sun coming in. So as a greenhouse gas, CO2's role as radiating heat away from the Earth, cooling the Earth, is far larger than any effect it has on warming the Earth, and that is just a fact. And it's laid out very clearly in my book with very good references to that effect. I just... Yeah, Let me tell you one other makes thing me shake about my head. CO2, because I, I, I need to uh, take a break pretty soon here. Um, but I'm going to tell you about CO2 in the ocean. In the ocean, CO2, as it is in the atmosphere, is the main source of carbon, the only source of carbon for all life. So... It's not an exaggeration to say that CO2 is the basis of all life on Earth. And without CO2 and the carbon it contains, there would be no life on Earth. That is a fair, correct statement to make. And everybody should drill that through themselves in order to get a little bit more perspective on this molecule, CO2. But CO2, as I mentioned before, is 50 times more of it in the oceans than there is in the atmosphere. And in the oceans, as it in the atmosphere, it is the main source of carbon for all the life in the sea. That's what the plants in the, in the sea, the big ones are called kelp or seaweed. The tiny microscopic ones are called phytoplankton. They are plants and they are the basis of the food chain. And coccolithophores are one of the main ones of that. And you should see a micron photograph, a microscope photograph of a coccolithophore because it's one of the most beautiful life forms on Earth, and you can't see them with your bare eyes. So take a look at the uh, internet there, coccolithophore, with, with all C's in it, no K's. Um, okay, 
So that's the main purpose of CO2 in the ocean is to feed the plants. But if there was no CO2 in the ocean, because CO2 produces carbonic acid as a byproduct, it's a weak acid, it counteracts the alkaline, alkalinity of the sodium, potassium, calcium, etc. If there was no CO2 in the ocean, there would be no life in the ocean. But that's just that point. The other point is, if there was no CO2 in the ocean, its pH would be 11.3, the same as Drano, which will eat anything out of your drain because it's so alkaline. It will burn your skin, right? That's why you wear gloves when you use it. So if it wasn't for the buffering effect of CO2, bringing the alkalinity of the ocean down to a pleasant 8 instead of 11.3, which is three orders of magnitude more alkalinity than 8, CO2, before it even begins to feed the life, makes life possible in the sea by putting its... CO, it, it, its pH down to around 8, average around 8 on the oceans of the world. And now life can actually benefit from the CO2 by using it as a food. So in the same way that CO2 has a secondary benefit on the land by making plants more efficient with water, in the sea, CO2 makes the sea actually conducive to life, to the existence of life, which it wouldn't be if there wasn't any CO2 there. So if you don't think CO2 is beneficial after listening to this, I don't know what would ever convince you because I've been studying this kind of stuff for more than 50 years. I started 30 years ago in deep study of the whole climate issue. And I have seen people try to critique my book and they fail miserably because there's nothing there that they can critique. It is true. It is true that the warmest oceans in the world have the highest biodiversity of coral and reef fish. It is true that polar bears are thriving. It is true that the earth is greening everywhere. It is true that China and India are making the greatest contribution because they're making the biggest amount of CO2, and they're also making the most plant life to feed their people and grow their forests. So it's all completely opposite of what the doomsday people are saying. The earth is not coming to an end. The earth has a tremendous, long, wonderful life ahead of it, and so do our children's 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 children and all of the bugs and bees and insects and everything else, uh, the birds and uh, the mammals and the marine life. Everything has a great life ahead of it. Uh, it might get another degree or two warmer before it starts getting cooler again because these 500-year cycles that have been going on for the last 6,000 years seem to be pretty steady. Uh, and uh, so I say celebrate CO2 and read my book, Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom. Uh, if you need any convincing, it's in there. Uh, and I'd be happy to correspond with anybody. My email is in the front page of the book in the, where it says copyright and all that stuff. Uh, there's my email. Please email me. I'm an open book. I have no boss to tell me what to say or not. That's why I can say what I believe, because I've never had a boss all my life since I was working for my dad in the logging camp here in Winter Harbor, British Columbia on Vancouver Island, the largest island on the west coast of the Americas, by the way, from Alaska to Argentina. It's a beautiful island. Come and see it someday. But don't stay, because there's enough of us here already. We don't want anybody coming in here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I love it. You are... You are you are uncancelable because you work for yourself, and that's what we need today are voices of people who are brave enough to speak uh, contradictory uh, narratives to the mainstream narrative that are brave enough to be, as you said, skeptics and, and do so uh, with courage. And I think that it raises a lot of fascinating questions. So thank you for your work. And uh, at the end of one of Joe Rogan's podcasts with Alex Jones, Alex Jones goes, Team Carbon! And, you know, Alex Jones is a pretty polarizing figure, but I think that that you're on Team Carbon, and, and I'm I'm pretty much convinced that, that carbon dioxide is an incredibly valuable thing in some ways, and I look forward to going down this rabbit hole. But thank you so much for your work, and thank you for coming on the podcast, Patrick. 
Thanks a lot, Paul. Yeah, celebrate CO2. That's my slogan. I should get a T-shirt with it.